Good evening and welcome to all. I'm Thomas Dabbs, Aoyama Gakuin University. On behalf of the Aoyama Gakuin Eibun Gakkai, the English Literary Society, I would like to extend our warmest welcome to those of you who are joining us from other universities and from the public sphere on Zoom tonight. Thank you so much this from me and from our faculty and our students. Andy Kesson of Roehampton University will speak with us tonight about Shakespeare related topics that he is currently working on in London. He is investigating with a team, a project funded by a substantial grant from the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the AHRC in the United Kingdom. This project is entitled Box Office Bears. Andy is working with uh, scholars, archaeologists, geneticists, literature and theater experts to shed much more light on bear baiting in Shakespeare's London and on the use of bears as entertainment during this period. And he will also introduce us to his program, A Bit Lit, that's available on YouTube and that celebrates research and creativity of all kinds. And will tell us about forthcoming online events with this project. So Andy, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. I'm really delighted to uh, share this work with you. So as Tom's just said, my brief is to talk about uh, the Box Office Bears Research Project and then um, a bit lit, which is a public facing forum for sharing research of all kinds. So I shall uh, do that now. Uh, can everyone see the PowerPoint okay? Is that looking good? I will assume someone will stop me if you can't, <laughs> since I can't see reactions. Um, so this is the, uh, the Box Office Bears uh, project. Um, and I should clarify, I'm one of three lead researchers on the project. Um, and the, um, the person uh, in charge of it is in fact not myself, but the archeologist, uh, Hannah O. Reagan. Um, and I'm working alongside her and a number of other scholars who I'll introduce you to um, through this talk. Um, I'll be showing the website a little bit later, but the website is um, hopefully uh, intuitively uh, boxofficebears.com. And we shamelessly chose the name for the project partly because it abbreviates in English to the word Bob, which is one of my favorite names. So I'm gonna start by um, listing for you a series of um, early modern celebrities, of famous names, famous uh, people in early modern England. Ned of Canterbury, George of Cambridge, uh, Don John, Nan Stiles, Beef of Ipswich, Robin Hood, Blind Robin, Judith of Cambridge, Kate of Kent, uh, Mal Cutpurse, named after um, a uh, woman in the period called Mal Frith, uh, or Mal Cutpurse as they were also known, um, Mad Bess and Rose of Bedlam. Um, and I've rather ruined the surprise for you by having the list of bulls on the other side of the PowerPoint. Ignore that for a moment if you would, but the names on the left are all names of bears, uh, famous bears in this period. Um, and this comes from a document from uh, 1632 um, by John Taylor called Bulls, Bears and Horses. Um, and next to the list of bears, he also lists four famous bulls, Goldilocks, Emperor, Dash and Juggler. I guess there's a number of things to say about this opening list. Um, and the first is that bears just appear to be everywhere in early modern England. When we think of Shakespeare, we don't tend to think of, of bears. Um, I'm very aware I'm speaking to you today from um, a country which has no native bears, England, to you in Japan, where you do have native bears. There have been no native bears in England since um, the historical presence, uh, historical records of humans in England. Bears were prehistoric um, native creatures of England, but seem to have been extinct by the time the Romans arrive in England. Um, and yet early modern England seems to be alive with 
uh, a number of bears uh, to the point where they become famous celebrities that we get to hear about. And I guess most crucially from this list of bears, it's particularly striking if you compare it to the list of bulls, bears get associated with particular parts of England. What would it mean to watch Ned of Canterbury um, next to George of Cambridge? Do we have a kind of, I don't know, football allegiance going on, different kind of clubs from different kinds of cities, and you go and support your local club or you support the club you most like? There's something happening here where bulls are being, sorry, bears are being pulled into the kind of geographic and the social uh, sway of early modern England. They're becoming politicized, they're becoming built into the way humans map the world around them. So I'm going to start this talk by thinking about some of Bear's greatest hits on stage in the early modern theatre. Um, uh, again, when we think of Shakespeare's England, we don't tend to think uh, of Bear's. And when we think of the playhouses of Shakespeare's time, um, we don't tend to think of Bear's either. Um, I think someone might have their microphone on if it's possible to mute it. Uh, so here are some examples of us hearing about bears in the world of the playhouse. And I'm going to start with Shakespeare. And I'm going to start with his most famous stage direction, Exit Pursued by a Bear. This is from The Winter's Tale. Um, and there are lots of things we could say about this stage direction. I'm fascinated by its grammar. So the human actor here playing a human character is told to exit. And then in the rest of the phrase, pursued by a bear. Is the bear being played by another human actor in a bear costume? In which case, where is that actor's cue? Where does that actor get told what to do? The bear actor isn't told to enter and they aren't really given an exit. The exit is implicit in the exit of the human. So there's something interesting, I think, happening at the level of grammar. But might this be a real bear on stage chasing off a character in a Shakespeare play? We don't know the answer uh, to those questions, but the way that the bear appears briefly in this stage direction, only being mentioned in the act of leaving the stage, not of entering the stage, I think tells us quite a lot about how bears tend to be marginalized and decentered even when they get mentioned. But we also hear from uh, Shakespeare about bears in stage dialogue. So in Merry Wives of Windsor, for example, one of the characters tells us that they've seen Sackerson, one of the most famous bears from the period, loose, set free 20 times and have taken him by the chain. I have uh, kind of restored his place in captivity. In uh, Macbeth, uh, Macbeth himself at the end of the play says, they have tied me to a stake, I cannot fly, but bear-like, I must fight the course. I've been pinned down, I've been tied to a stake, and I'll show you that in a moment, what that might look like, um, and I am now being treated like a bear and must fight the course of dogs, the sequence of dogs, which will be set on me. And that idea is um, strong enough for Shakespeare that it reappears in a play written not too far away in time, King Lear where the Earl of Gloucester says, I am tied to the stake and I must stand the course. There the language is much less obviously about bears and dogs to modern eyes, but it would be perfectly clear to an early modern audience. And you can see in comparison with the language of Macbeth that this is exactly the same kind of uh, jargon about um, bear-based bear cruelty. And finally, Malvolio at the end of Twelfth Night leaves the stage saying, I'll be revenged on the whole pack of you. Um, and again, it's quite hard to see that that is a reference uh, to baiting or to hunting, but it absolutely is in the language of the whole pack of you. And indeed, um, Jason Scott Warren has written brilliantly about how Twelfth Night is a play about baiting, about baiting specifically the character of Malvolio, sticking him at the center of the stage, being cruel to him and watching what happens. All administered through the language, but also the staging practices of baiting. And it culminates in that final line. So even at the level of Shakespeare, bears are everywhere. Stage direction, dialogue, uh, and potentially also physically on stage in the case of The Winter's Tale. 
But bears are everywhere in non-Shakespearean drama too. So three early plays um, from the 1580s um, make us think about bears. Um, the play Nusidorus opens with a bear on stage, defeated by its protagonist. So the bear serves as a way of showing how brave and how strong the protagonist is. Rather adorably, there's a character in the old wives' tale who is an old man who turns into a bear at night. And so the locals bring him pots of milk and honey to keep him happy so that he doesn't come and be a scary bear uh, in their community. We don't see the bear in the old wives' tale, but it's absolutely there at the level of plot. In the play Mother Bombi, again, there are no bears on stage, but bears do haunt the language of the play. One character says to another, are you there with your bears? Which seems to be some sort of proverbial phrase, meaning, are you still talking about that same old topic? Are you there with your bears? I guess it seems to me that that's a good question to ask about early modern people. And much later in the 1610s, there are two masks at the Jacobean court, which um, stage bears as part of the mask, Oberon the fairy prince and the Lord's mask. These include uh, what are called white bears, which may, may therefore be polar bears. And as some final examples of how bears haunt the early modern stage, even when we do not have the text of a play, when a play has been lost, which is very normal uh, for the early modern period, most plays do not survive at the level of their text, at the level of their words. Even when we lose plays, we can still hear about bears on stage. So a transcription of a early modern bookseller's list of plays, an itemization of the books, the playbooks that the bookseller owns, includes one item, the lover's holiday or the bear. Um, and likewise, we hear of a lost play called Cox of Cullumpton, which is recorded at the Rose Playhouse by Simon Foreman in 1600. And Foreman tells us that in this play of Cox and Cullington and his three sons, Henry, Peter and John, Peter and John both slew themselves for Peter being fronted with the sight of a bear uh, looking like a sprite appearing to John and him when they sat upon division of the lands. Um, they've just lost their father. They're weighing up um, what they're going to inherit. As they're doing that, uh, the sight of a bear, uh, uh, as a, a sprite appearing in likeness of a bear, um, Peter fell out of his wits and was lied, i.e. laid, was laid in a dark house and beat out his brains against a post. And John stabbed himself. So this is a kind of passing reference uh, to, the, to a plot of a play that we, we don't have. And this is only one of the things that happens in this very busy sounding uh, play. But um, the sight of a bear, apparently being played by a devil or a ghost, uh, causes both of these two central characters uh, to kill themselves. And we actually hear about this play a year earlier when the Admiral's Men Theatre Company pay two playwrights um, for writing it. And they're doing that as the Admiral's Men um, are preparing to move to the fortune and as Shakespeare's company are opening the globe. So, you know, as uh, if you're based at the Rose Theatre, which as I'll show you on the map in a moment, is in Southwark, south of the river um, and away from the city of London, if you're, if you're based there and you've been the only playhouse for a decade and a half, and suddenly you have a rival theatre, the Globe, opening up next to you, a play about a bear is the sort of play you might want to stage as you prepare to be in open competition with, uh, with the playhouse next door. And then um, the Hope itself, a playhouse opening in 1615, also shows us ways to think about bears and playing because the hope was uh, explicitly built to stage plays with humans and games with animals. The contract uh, tells the carpenters to newly erect, build and set up one other game place or playhouse fit and convenient in all things, both for players to play in and for the game of bears and bulls to be baited in the same both for players to play in 
and for the game of bears and bulls to be baited in the same. So um, what I'm trying to show you across all of those various examples is the way in which um, playhouses, which we think of as human spaces, constantly seem to act as a kind of magnet for bears. Real bears, pretend bears, references to bears, um, bears as focal points in the narrative of a play. Um, again and again, bears in playhouses and bears in plays. So what does it mean to think about the theatre of Shakespeare's time from the point of view of a bear? What does it do to centre the archaeological evidence of these animal remains rather than the literary or theatrical evidence of surviving plays? Um, and what does it mean to start to think seriously about the ways in which the South Bank in London, um, Southwark, uh, was dominated actually less by playhouses and more by animals and spaces for baiting? So this is an image taken from the, uh, the various archaeological write-ups um, of the sites uh, at Southwark, um, showing us the various uh, bear gardens and playhouses which just to be clear, were not always open at the same time as each other. Um, but I'll be showing you images later of these same spaces to give you a sense of just how dominated they were, not just by the animals themselves, but by the kinds of infrastructure that the animals need. You know, where do the animals wash? What do they eat? What do they drink? What kind of noises do they, do they make? Who can see them? Um, can I come out of the city of London and see them like I would at a zoo, for example? What kind of human, animal interactions does this space open up? Um, so yes, that's the kind of uh, core part of my talk today is to ask what happens when we think about Shakespeare and the world around him from the point of view of the bears themselves. I'm sorry to tell you that uh, a year into this research project, we've so far encountered no evidence at all of bears reading Shakespeare. As far as we are aware, bears are entirely indifferent and uninterested in Shakespeare. So Box Office Bears is hoping to do something about this, to revisit the archeological evidence, uh, which is in itself extraordinary, alongside the literary and documentary evidence of bears in early modern England. And to ask, what is baiting? What is it as a practice? What does the word mean? What does it signify? To ask where it happens. I've just shown you an example of where it happens, uh, in, um, in Southwark, in what is now the South Bank um, of London, um, were those the only places that baiting would happen? Or did it happen more generally across London and across England? Who stages it? Who watches it? And what does it mean to do those things? Um, baiting appears to be one of the few animal cruelty-based sports which invites in a mixed gender audience. Men and women watch baiting in a way that they don't seem to watch cockfighting or dogfighting, which appear to be all male activities in the main part. So that's just one example, I suppose, of the place that baiting um, occupies in Tudor and Stuart society. And baiting is actually distinctive as well in being open to pretty much anybody from top to bottom of the social hierarchy. The monarch would watch baiting and ordinary people would watch baiting. Where are the bears from, given that there's no such thing as a native English bear in this period? Where do they come from? Um, how does baiting work um, as a performance activity? And where does it fit in the wider entertainment industry? Um, I think of the 16th century as a really vibrant time for the entertainment industry, in which spaces like playhouses are suddenly opening in extraordinary number, particularly around the 1570s. Baiting is happening before, during, and after that process, but where does it fit and how do those different worlds relate? And we're also going to be asking on this project how our various methodologies might fit together. So what does it mean to work with archaeology, with ancient DNA, with documentation, with literary and theatrical documents? And we'll be working on this project through um, a series of public workshops, some of which will be online, so we'd love to see you there if you'd like to join us. And we're also really keen to take seriously and to foreground the practice of combat, of martial arts, of fighting in this spectacle. 
And since we can't talk to bears, we're going to be working with professional wrestlers and other kinds of martial artists to think about how uh, combat works as a form of performance. So um, here is the uh, project team oh, in all our glory. I apologize to Sophie Charlton because I think my face might be on top of hers, uh, but you can go to our website to see her picture better. Can I move that? Oh, I can. Great. Um, so uh, Hannah O'Regan, um, oh, excuse me, I can't get my PowerPoint. Here we are. Um, Hannah O'Regan uh, is leading the project and is a zoo archeologist and historian of uh, bears. And she's working in particular with Lizzie Wright on the right hand side here, also a zoo archaeologist, and we'll be doing um, the isotope analysis uh, for the project. Um, I'm leading the performance and archive research with my Rehampton colleague, uh, Callan Davis. Um, and then Gregor Larson of Oxford will be working on the archaeogenetics and ancient DNA with Sophie Charlton, who my image keeps getting in the way of, but there's Sophie. Um, and as I say, the, uh, the bringing together of these disciplines, these methods, um, itself feels like a, a meaningful and important part of our project. How do we speak to each other? How do we share each other's languages? How do we learn from each other? And how do we challenge one another? What are the blind spots of our various disciplines? What can one discipline do better or differently than another? And how do we bring all those things together? So what is animal baiting then? As early as 5th, uh, 1174, we hear that in London on feast days, huge bears do battle with hounds let loose upon them. And part of the really important language of baiting, as we've already seen, is the language of letting loose. So the bear which is tied down, the bear which uh, is fixed in terms of its access to space and freedom of movement um, is set upon um, by dogs. And as you can see from this image here, the dogs are huge. Something quite distinctive, I think, is happening with baiting in England. Um, England, as early as the Roman Empire, was well known for its massive dogs, which are called mastiffs. Um, and so there seems to be some sort of association between Englishness and these mastiff dogs uh, from the Roman period onwards which perhaps turns into, um, in more recent years, an association between Britain and the bulldog, kind of a British empire, 18th, 19th century, and particularly early 20th century um, idea. Before the bulldog comes along, it's the mastiff, huge, fierce animal, which England seems to be associated with. So if you're an English person watching this sport, are you watching an animal you associate with yourself and with your country fighting an animal you associate with foreign places, with places which are different to you. Um, we also uh, often find that the bears themselves are gendered female, and the dogs are not only gendered male, but are often brought to the baiting arena by their male owners, who tend to be aristocrats. So you've got, a, um, again, an image of uh, animals strongly associated with masculinity and with high status, the dogs, versus uh, the bears, which are often thought of as female. So as ways of watching this combat and to be thinking less about animals and more about nationhood, nationality, racial identity, uh, and gender. But baiting itself, I think, might be a bit more of a movable feast than we often think. When we look at the early documents from this period, we often find the words baiting confused with the words beating, so a more general kind of violence, um, and even with the word betting. And betting seems to be woven into the world of baiting. So the audience is being encouraged to spend money um, to bet on the outcome of the fight, and perhaps not just the outcome of the fight, but the process of the fight, what kinds of actions will occur during it. Baiting, betting, and beating all seem to be crammed into this idea of animal baiting. But it is, as I say, the pitting of one animal against another for human entertainment. It's at heart a blood sport and a cruel one. But I think, interestingly, if you own a bear, the one thing you do not want to do as a business person is to lose it. 
So I think that it's less of a blood sport than we often think. And the image to the right is a great example of an emphasis on violence. But um, we have a diary, for example, of a, a, someone who owned a bear, a bear ward, touring England um, day in, day out, uh, baiting the bear on an almost daily basis. And so the bears do live to fight the next day. There seems to be, as uncomfortable as it might feel, a history of care built into the world of baiting. And I do wonder how much these fights are being stage managed um, and how careful the owners are of the bears. I'm afraid I don't think they were very uh, careful at all of the dogs. And I think part of the spectacle was watching um, dog, dogs being killed in these fights. But the bears themselves, I do wonder um, quite how much um, they were being protected. Of course, still deeply traumatic, terrifying for the bear, who does not know that the process is being stage managed and still with the risk of danger and of death to the bear throughout. And the bears um, were not treated humanely uh, by their keepers. So there's all kinds of different tensions happening there. Baiting is widespread across early modern England and rivals the theatre in popularity. I'm not sure we know which is the more popular or which is the more lucrative in the early modern period. And it grew in commercial potential alongside the playhouses, um, generating fixed arenas for play, as we saw in Southwark, as well as expanding regional touring routes. Um, and we'll be seeing that towards the end of this talk, just how much baiting um, is, a, is an English phenomenon, not just a London phenomenon. And it's a curiously understudied topic, despite being so central to early modern culture and with its uh, massive implications for our understanding of everything from drama to histories of social status, gender, migration and animals. So here is a map of um, England, an early modern map of England, which um, has marked out for you the locations of the playhouses in this period. Um, this is a map generated by Heather Knight at the Museum of London Archaeology. And it shows you not only where the playhouses are in England, uh, sorry, in London, um, but also their shape. So here you've got the city walls running around London, and here you've got the River Thames. London is a tiny place in this period. Um, and you've got some playhouses inside the city, uh, which tend to be oblong. You've got playhouses to the west and to the east of the city, which again tend to be oblong. You've got playhouses to the north in places like Shoreditch, which again, contrary to the way theatre historians think about it, tend to be oblong. There's only one amphitheatre in the north of London, and that is the playhouse called the theatre. And then across the river, there's this curious community of round amphitheatre spaces, the Rose and later the Globe and the Swan. And as you've already seen around here too, are the baiting arenas, which are themselves round. And so there's something happening here at the level of London space. Where is the baiting? Where are the playhouses? Where do they sit in and around the city? But also at the level of building design, the kinds of spaces in which you would work with uh, humans and animals to put on entertainments. And I'm going to zoom in now to the South Bank. So again, here are some early modern images for us um, of uh, the South Bank itself. Um, and I think it's really striking that if you're going to build a large baiting arena, you do it on the river. The one thing that we often forget to say about London is that it's a port. And so putting it here, uh, right on the artery uh, of travel for uh, not just the city, but for the country, is a pretty obvious thing to do. If you are going to import a bear, it's going to come by boat. And there you are. Um, I also think uh, it makes a lot of sense that the baiting arenas are built around here because of the amount of space. So theatre historians have often asked, I'm going to go back again to my earlier slide, have often asked um, why the big amphitheatres are not built inside the city of London. But if you just take a look at the city of London, there's no room for an amphitheatre. These buildings are big and they have a massive footprint beyond simply their own size. There's an infrastructure around them. You need spaces to congregate outside. You need spaces to sell uh, beer and food, for example. And so you need uh, an expansive kind of space. And so here we have the baiting arenas, but crucially, if you can see here, 
here is a bull and down here are dog kennels with dogs poking their heads out and the same again here so this is what i mean about the kind of footprint of a building the building itself may just be this size but you need all of this infrastructure around it and here we have ponds presumably for the animals to drink or to wash here is an alternative image of the same uh, space and i really like how you can start to see further details of the animals within the arena. And here is a third image still of um, our various mix of playhouse and baiting arena in Southwark. So what we found on these sites when archeologists have dug them up in the 1980s and over the um, sub subsequent decades uh, is a repository of animals, including bears, and vast amounts of dogs and quite a lot of horses. So what can the bones tell us? They can tell us the kinds of species which were present at this site. Um, are we looking at um, particular kinds of bear or dog, for example? They can tell us the size of the animal, which is important for thinking about the spectacle of baiting. Uh, as I've already suggested, I think size is really important for the way dogs are thought about. But it also tells us something about how much animals are being cared for, because in order to become big, you need to be fed and looked after. And same goes for the other thing that uh, DNA can tell us, which is the age of the animal at death. Again, one of the things that's really surprised us in the first year of the project, we haven't done much of the ancient DNA work yet. It takes a long time. But one of our first findings is that the animals are much, much older than we expected and essentially um, uh, kind of at the end of their lives as they die, as opposed to dying earlier through maltreatment or through the baiting process itself. These animals live a long life. The um, DNA, when it's shared, can tell us if we have family communities here. So are the animals being bred together, for example, or are they being sourced from the same place uh, overseas? The pathology of the bones, their injuries and diseases can tell us quite a bit about the lives of the animals. And crucially, the injuries give us some kind of insight into what baiting looks like, because the process of baiting, the specifics of baiting, never really gets described in early modern documents. Um, butchery and gnawing can also tell us how one animal might be being fed to another animal, for example. And of course, the DNA can also clue us into the origins of an animal that may tell us uh, where, uh, where it is from. And finally, we may be able to tell uh, the diet of an animal from the isotopes and the ancient DNA. So a whole sense of the animal's lived history uh, may be encoded inside these bones. I'm saying may, because at the moment, as I say, we're still doing this work and we don't know what kind of outcomes we get and you know a very possible outcome of this sort of work is a negative result a zero result the snapshot of animals found on the site also give us as i say a really good scope a really good sense of what kind of animals were present including horses including monkeys and although we haven't yet found evidence of polar bears we do hear of polar bears on this site um, from the documentary evidence or at least I should say we hear of white bears, which we presume are polar bears. We actually hear that King James I orders polar bears to be baited in the Thames, put into the water and baited from there by boat. Thanks to a succession of different documents, we also hear um, what the animals were eating, not always in especially precise language, but both of these documents are account books recording costs. On the left, you've got the very well-known Henslow's diary here recording uh, meat for the bear. And on the right is an extraordinary document, um, a bear ward's diary that I mentioned earlier. Uh, this bear ward is traveling around the south of England with uh, no less than two bears. And as I hope you can see from the writing, this is a document being written by someone who firstly um, is not especially literate. It's finding it quite difficult to write. And secondly, is writing in a rush. So this seems to be as the uh, bear ward is traveling from place to place. Um, this is them literally writing it down uh, on the move. And here is a record for bread for the bears. 
I wonder if the dogs, though, for all of my emphasis on the bears in this talk, are the biggest part of the spectacle for an early modern English audience. Um, I wonder if the bear, the dogs, which are so much more firmly associated with their owners, are the kind of the the focal point for someone watching this combat. And so I think it's worth, as we look at the bears on this, uh, sorry, the dogs on this map, noting the absence of bears from this map. Dogs may be, as I say, the kind of at, at the core of this practice in a way that the bears simply aren't. Um, and there is an example of a dog skull that we found. Um, and I'm sorry I've got nothing there next to it to show you its scale, but I hope it gives you some sense of just how massive these dogs are. So as I'm starting to wrap up now, I'm going to show you um, a final document, which is a visiting um, German tourist coming to London in 1584 and going across to watch a show. And they tell us that after seeing a number of things on stage, the next was that a number of men and women came forward from a separate compartment, dancing, conversing, and fighting with each other. Also a man who threw some white bread among the crowd that scrambled for it. Right over the middle of the place, a rose was fixed. This rose being set on fire by a rocket, suddenly lots of apples and pears fell out of it, down upon the people below. Whilst the people were scrambling for the apples, some rockets were made to fall down upon them out of the rows, which caused a great fright, but amused the spectators. After this, rockets and other fireworks came flying out of all corners. And that was the end of the play. So I don't know about you, but this feels very different to me compared to a play like Hamlet, for example. We think of early modern plays as just having humans in them. But here is an example of how humans and animals seem to be included in the same show, in a show which includes special effects like rockets, fireworks, and the exploding roses. But it also seems to include an act of baiting of the audience. The audience have bread thrown in amongst them and they scramble for it. Early modern England was a place of food shortage and of poverty and of real hunger. So the crowd seem to be being baited with food, just as the bears are in this moment. So here is um, uh, Southwark, um, again on a map of early modern London. Um, and here are some of the things that we found on that site. But we also are starting to hear as we begin our documentary survey of England more generally, we're starting to hear of places like Chester in the northwest of the country, um, asking for bears to be delivered from Southwark up to Chester. So we're hearing about what seem to us at least to be quite extraordinarily long trade routes for bears, bears being sent about the country. And document after document after document is showing us bears across England, bears living in towns and cities. And I'm about to show you an example of that to finish this part of the talk. So here are the kind of core concerns then as we go forward. Where did the bears come from? Where did they go? How did they travel the country? Social status and gender has been at the heart of much that I've said. So who was involved in the animal sports industry? What were the economics of bear baiting? What did it cost? Was it lucrative? How did it compare to the theater or other kinds of public entertainment? And how can we understand more about the animals involved, their experiences and reflect on the place of cruelty in this practice. I'm gonna finish then by just showing you some images of some of the professional wrestlers that we're working with and some historical images of famous kinds of combat. As I say, I'm really excited to hand over some of this project um, away from academics and towards people who do this for a living and who know what it means to fight in front of an audience for money and to work up people's emotions by fighting. Our partners and collaborators, I should briefly thank before I show you um, a quick film. Um, the Museum of London Archaeology, I've mentioned already, the Badgers Trust, uh, Dulwich Archives, Wrestling Resurgence, and the Rose Playhouse are all working with us on this project. And as we go forward, do keep an eye out for our website, boxofficebears.com, um, for performance workshops happening online, 
and for a number of articles, scholarly um, and public facing, and an open access monograph. But as I say, I'm going to move now to show you a film. So um, this film is um, up on the Abitlit website, and I should be talking about Abitlit to close this talk. Uh, and it's the second film we've made from the box office fairs uh, project about a fire in Nantwich in the uh, middle of England. So I'll show you the film. A bit lit, celebrating research and creativity of all kinds. Our story begins in 1583 in Nantwich. Nantwich is currently A, on fire, and B, full of bears. We should explain. Probably wondering how I got here. This is John Seckerston. John is a bear ward and provides bears for sports and entertainment around the area. Oh, look, it's the bears! What a clever bear! Hey! We perform at fairs, high days, and holidays. He worked for many years as the bear ward to the Earl of Derby. He also buys and sells bears as far afield as Bristol. Can I offer you a bear? Oh, yes, please. So John was quite successful. He owned a number of bears who lived in the stable at, by sheer coincidence, the bear. Which brings us back to the night of the fire. We don't really know how it started, but there were a lot of flammable buildings around. One theory is a mishap in a kitchen, leading to a fire getting out of control. A kitchen fire was whipped up by a boisterous westerly wind, becoming most terrible and vehement. The worst kind of fire. Now this puts all of us in a difficult situation. Bears are good at many things, but not locked doors. Please, please, I know I just had them. There goes the blacksmith. Hello, Mary's washing just went up. Yes, but how do we get out? Thankfully, John came and let us out. Now, what happens next depends on if you believe all the anti-bear propaganda or if you can keep an open mind and understand the relationships between bears and people. So this is where we came in. Argument one. The defendants, that is the bears, formerly resident at the Bear Inn, did run amok on the night of the fire, causing all sorts of problems, scaring people left, right and center, Maybe they orchestrated the fire themselves in a desperate bid for freedom. They are accused of being aggressive and violent and generally of a wild and savage nature. And heard to repeatedly growl with rage. Terrified people, unused to this wild animal and force of nature, fainted and ran in terror for their very lives. Meanwhile, Nantwich is still on fire. There is some firefighting going on, but the men claim the women are too afraid to really help. Whereof the women were so afraid they durst not carry water unless they were accompanied with men having weapons to defend them from the same bears. Of course, that's what the men would say, as obviously they were not scared at all. <clears throat> I shall protect you from this a mock bear. Oh, actually, is that the time? Run away! Run away! 
Or there is argument two. It is true that the bears were seen about the town in the chaos of the fire. They were released from their lodgings so that they wouldn't die in the fire. Although some other animals were not so lucky. <clears throat> but the bears were well known about the town. They lived there, and people would have been used to seeing them around the place. <laughs> Often, bears were given human names, like Ned of Canterbury, Kate of Kent, George Stone, or Bob. Morning, Bob. Good morning, Peter. So there is no evidence they caused any more damage to property or harm to people than the fire. They may have been running amok, but a large fire is scary to anybody, so who can blame them? There is no evidence they set the fire, and maybe they didn't do much to help. And nobody seems to quite know where the bears went afterwards. Maybe they passed into legend and the many bear stories recorded in neighboring parishes and across the country on a scale from the mundane to the magnificent. One example being the one who put his paw on an altar in next door Nutsford in 1617. Yeah. So that's the bears explained. Were there any other theories about the fire? Whatever else happened, we're told the fire may have actually been started through negligence of undiscreet persons brewing. So maybe it was beers, not bears, that were the problem. <laughs> oh, beers, not bears. <laughs> oh. But you'll be pleased to hear that petitions passed as far afield as Bristol and Bury St Edmunds, raising funds for the rebeautifying of Natwich. And this is just one of the stories about bears in the early modern period. The bears came out for high days and holidays, and people wanted to see them. Box Office Bears aims to look at the maybe intertwined facets of the human-bear relationship. And learn more about these animals, their keepers and audiences. Join us to discover the cultural, economic and ethical contexts that made up a society in which a fire in a 16th century provincial English town can unloose four great bears onto the streets and in which a pub called the Bear Inn did exactly what it said on the sign. The bears are in. Um, so thank you so much for your attention so far. I've got eight more minutes um, to go and then I'll, I'll hand over to you for questions. I really look forward to questions. But Tom also asked me to speak about the platform on which that animation is based um, a bit lit. I feel like I should first start by apologizing, given that I'm speaking uh, to you in Japan, um, which is such a great nation for the history of animation. So I apologize for showing you our very, very low budget attempt, first attempt um, at uh, an animation. So a bit that was set up um, on the first day of the UK lockdown uh, in March 2020. Um, essentially because I was surrounded by people that I love and care about um, who work in theatre and um, all kinds of creative arts or in the university industry as researchers. And all of them were saying to me, I don't understand why my job matters at a time of medical emergency, at a time of COVID. And I just felt like that was so, um, so wrong. And I wanted um, a space online to be able to celebrate um, the humanities and creative work. Um, we just published yesterday our 150th film, 150, which blows my mind. And I don't quite know how we've, uh, how we've done that. But I'm really excited about this space we've created for um, bringing research and bringing creativity to new audiences. And I hope building um, 
fun into the way in which we talk about education and research. And that film is an example of how we try and make what we do fun. So I'm just gonna show you the website now, just give you a sense of what's on here. Um, there are lots of different ways of navigating the website. So there are tags here that you can follow. So if you're interested, for example, in wrestling, um, we, um, Oh, I need to look at that. That's no good at all. Um, if you're interested in wrestling, you click on the wrestling and combat tag, then you will get a whole sequence of films um, from, uh, for example, Claire Warden, who is a researcher and a theatre maker who works on professional wrestling as a research topic. But we also speak to wrestlers in, uh, well, around the world. Um, Nick Bradford is a American wrestler who is also a poet, uh, for example. Um, so those are, that's one way of navigating our content. You can also click up here on the um, top left where you will find um, all of our posts in chronological order from most recent to the oldest. Um, so here are the films uh, of the last few weeks, for example. So if I click on yesterday's film, which is Eula Klein talking about her new book on cross-dressing women and non-binary people in the 18th century, in 18th century British uh, literature, again, you can kind of see the layout of our site. We have a title for a film, we have a summary of its contents, we have our tags here that you can follow through, we have a list of the people in the film, we have a set of further resources. Um, Eula didn't want any further resources, but often we can put, you know, scholarly articles up there, um, so anyone who wants to do more reading can go on. And then finally at the bottom, we always recommend three further films. So if you enjoyed this film about 18th century cross-dressing, we've got um, Julia Tatchek, on 18th century trans writers. We've got a film about um, the devil on holiday in 18th century England, which is a common theme in 18th century literature. And we've got a fantastic film uh, with Rachel Mesh and Dustin Friedman on their recent books on queer and transgender communities in 19th century France and England. So there's quite a lot on the homepage. And the homepage simply shows you our most recent film. We publish films every Wednesday at 12 o'clock British time. And then if you click on this arrow, this is the other way of going through our material. This simply takes you through chronologically. So I'll just show you our four most recent films. Um, Connor Heffernan uh, is a scholar of 18th and 19th century bodybuilding and fitness cultures. And it's completely fascinating on what the Napoleonic Wars did to the ways in which European countries worried about male, the male physical body. Um, three weeks ago, we had Sasha Coward, who runs tours of museums and is um, really great on queer history uh, in particular. And then the final thing I'll show you is really what's happening to our platform next. So in January this year, I decided to go part-time as an academic. Uh, I'm still working as a researcher, as you've just seen in relation to box office bears. But I'm really interested um, in seeing whether our current moment um, gives us a new opportunity to build spaces for education, uh, research and creative work, which are kinder than I think the current um, higher education sector is, certainly in Britain and in North America. Um, and I'm hoping to start employing people um, and working with a group to uh, offer regular teaching and learning uh, opportunities on any topic whatsoever. Our launch event is on January the 15th next year. Um, this film here is our first advert for the film. We've got a second advert on its way. Um, and if you uh, want to look here, um, this is the kind of new phase of the website now. Um, as it says here, a bit lit is going interactive and we're hoping to create um, regular events, regular courses, as I say, on any topic whatsoever. Um, which really build the audience into the content and get them thinking actively, interactively, and thinking in terms of empathy about the topics that they study. So our first event, excuse my, uh, excuse my clock. Um, our first event is called The Day Out at Shakespeare's Theatre. And it's offering to take you to the theatre in 1600. Come with us on Zoom, online, and we'll take you to the theatre in 1600. Uh, you'll meet Heather Knight, the archaeologist who dug up most of the playhouses of early modern England, and she will take you into the Curtain Playhouse in Shoreditch. You'll meet a different, a whole range of different kinds of performers, um, classical performers 
who work in big Shakespeare theatres like the Royal Shakespeare Company in the UK, for example. But you'll also meet performers who work um, in a more fringe or experimental part of the sector, um, and um, also queer and transgender performers, who again won't be part of the kind of mainstream parts of theatre. So you'll see a whole range of different performance styles. And crucially, you'll meet some improvisers who will create an early modern play um, in 15 minutes based on choices that the audience make about what kind of story they want, what kind of special effects they want, etc. We're going to work with some smells from the early modern period. So our audience will actually get to smell what London would have smelt like as you walked around it. And as I say, we want people to imagine that central journey, what it means to go to the theatre. Why would you go to the theatre when you could go to church, you could go to work, you could go and watch bear baiting, as we've just seen. What are you wearing? Who are you with? What does it mean to go there? How do you choose which theatre to go? Which play do you decide to see? And how do you know what your choices are? All of those sorts of questions we're hoping to bring to our audience at this, uh, at this first event. And as a bit lit continues now, we're going to be dependent on our audience to help us create this content. So do please get in touch with us if you have an interest in us creating content um, around your own work or your own interests. We're really hungry to create content which audiences would like to, would like to see and to hear. And we'd like to be as international and as inclusive as possible. So we're especially interested to get Japanese um, and East Asian uh, scholars and creative uh, practitioners and audiences into our work. I'm bang on 11 o'clock, so I shall finish there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Andy. That was just wonderful. I can't, the, the applause doesn't come over Zoom, so I gave you a round of applause <laughs> on uh, emoji. It takes me some.